Hello and welcome to another lecture from Professor Jake. Musical discussions in this lecture begin in the early 1960s with the first British invasion and end in the early 1980s with the second British invasion. We'll focus on how the Beatles played a crucial role in the shift from rock and roll to rock, the evolution of soul and Motown, protest songs, Woodstock, instrumental innovations such as synthesizers, disco, and the beginnings of MTV. Moreover, television takes over the world, completely destroying music as a sonic art form by the end of this discussion. Social issues that had been brooding for a long time finally erupt and musicians jump at the bit to create a musical commentary. The United States is in complete disarray, President Kennedy and other political figures are assassinated, citizens protest in the street, political scandals are unveiled, President Nixon resigns, and all of this leads to a complete division of the nation. The Fab Four. In the previous lecture about the origins of rock and roll, we discussed the conundrum of black artists recording a song only to have white covers gain more sales and recognition. Though they may not seem as obvious, we have witnessed similar trends in the music business, especially during the early jazz era. The Beatles are the final nail in the coffin of this saga. Before the Beatles completely redefined or perhaps destroyed rock and roll, they covered songs conceived by black artists and reaped the rewards. The destruction alludes to the group's mass market appeal, resultant imagery as the face of rock and roll, and musical experimentation which completely changed the direction and definition of the genre. The Beatles invaded America on February 7th of 1964 and appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show on February 9th. This particular performance had 73 million viewers, 34% of the population, making it the largest recorded audience for an American television program. The group kicked off their performance with All My Lovin', immediately followed by Till There Was You. Please pause the video and listen to the recordings of both of these tunes. You can utilize the Spotify link in the description or the Napster link also in the description or you can locate these audio recordings on your own. Welcome back. The group's first two albums were Please Please Me and With the Beatles. Please Please Me was released in the United States under a different title, introducing dot 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 The Beatles and it omitted their rendition of the Isley Brothers' Twist and Shout. Similarly, With the Beatles was released under the title Meet the Beatles! Exclamation point, which omitted their rendition of Chuck Berry's Roll Over Beethoven. American audiences were able to hear Fab Four renditions of Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and the Marvelette songs on the Beatles' third album released in the United States, titled... The Beatles' second album. This was not a new studio album. The Beatles' second album included Roll Over Beethoven, Twist and Shout, as well as Please, Mr. Postman, and spent five weeks at number one on the charts. Entering into Beatlemania, prior to the Rubber Soul album, the Beatles' sound was akin to the boy bands of the early 1960s. The four youths from Liverpool, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, created mass hysteria among the teenage female audience. Contributing factors of Beatlemania were the group's mop-top haircuts, clean-cut suits, and foreign accents. Screaming teenage girls aside, the musical success of the group should not go unnoticed. Over the course of 1964 to 1970, they had a top-selling single, one of every six-week period, and a top-selling album, one of every three-week period. 
A Hard Day's Night from 1964 was the first feature-length motion picture featuring the Beatles. The film is a mockumentary with the boys playing themselves. The accompanying soundtrack spent 14 weeks at number one. Similarly, Help of 1965 was a musical comedy adventure film that had an accompanying soundtrack album. As a film, this one was not as well received, but is seen as influential in early music video development. The soundtrack, on the other hand, contained Yesterday. Yesterday is unlike most recordings falling under the rock and roll categorization, as its instrumentation includes only voice, acoustic guitar, and strings. Additionally, while its structure follows AABA song form, the A sections are only seven bars long compared to the symmetrical eight bar duration. There are over 2,000 different covers of Yesterday in existence, but please pause your video now and listen to the Beatles version of Yesterday. The group's music really begins to get interesting when the Beatles stopped touring and became a studio-only band circa 1966. In December of 1965, the Beatles released their sixth studio album, Rubber Soul. This album is dominated by experimental sounds such as Indian sitar, harmonium, which is a pump-action reed organ, a piano recorded on tape and played back at half speed to imitate the sounds of a harpsichord on the tune In My Life. Listen to Indian sitar on Norwegian wood from this album. The Beatles continued their sonic experimentation on their seventh studio album, Revolver. This album's unfamiliar to rock and roll sounds include tape loops and backwards recordings on Tomorrow Never Knows, a string octet on Eleanor Rigby, and a brass band on Yellow Submarine. Eleanor Rigby does not use any instruments from the rock and roll stereotype catalog, such as guitars, drums, bass, etc. The track contains only voices and strings. Beyond the brass band, Yellow Submarine features sound effects and tape sounds. So let's pause the video and listen to Yellow Submarine, a psychedelic tune that falls under the same classification as Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good. So you call that rock and roll? Historical perspective is essential when discussing innovation. Modern audiences are accustomed to sounds that audiences in 1967 were not. We must recall that R&B emerged in the 1940s and evolved into rock and roll by the 1950s. The sound of that music and the leaders of that movement would never venture as far out as the Beatles did by the mid-1960s. When their 1967 album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, emerged, it completely redefined what could be rock and roll and the type of musicians, primarily white artists, that would dominate that changed genre. Why Sgt. Pepper's? Well, several factors. First, the commercial sales and success of this album rank it as one of the highest selling albums of all time, with over 32 million copies sold worldwide. Secondly, the sales suggest a mass market appeal. No previously discussed artist had become a true phenomenon. There were artists such as Franz Liszt, Benny Goodman, Frank Sinatra, and even Elvis Presley, they all had manias with wild fan bases, but they would never match the success of the Beatles. This assumption is backed by the musical content. There is something there for every record-purchasing demographic. Stylistic influences range from classical and romantic era composers, the blues, ragtime, brass bands, jazz, avant-garde 20th century composers, Indian and Eastern music, Broadway music, and of course rock and roll. Finally, if 
all of these fusions are on a rock and roll record, the confines of rock and roll have been expanded. The overnight success of Sgt. Pepper's had artists from the Rolling Stones to the Four Seasons trying to produce their own versions of the same product, though those were usually unsuccessful. So, let us listen to an orchestra tuning up, overdriven guitar, and brass band on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, then go ahead and listen to some call and response on with a little help from my friends and some psychedelic instrumental and vocal effects on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Pause the video and give all that a listen. The Beatles continued to experiment and involve the sounds of rock and roll until they disbanded in 1970. While their albums Magical Mystery Tour, The White Album, Yellow Submarine, Abbey Road, and Let It Be contained far out sounds Sgt. Pepper was first in the timeline. After the Beatles broke up, each of the four members went off to pursue their own solo projects. Before he was murdered, or arguably assassinated, in 1980, John Lennon married Yoko Ono and produced Imagine, Happy Christmas, and Beautiful Boy. In the 1970s, George Harrison continued to draw from Indian musical influences, especially on My Sweet Lord, which is surrounded by controversy as it's basically a copy and paste of the chiffons he's so fine. George Harrison died of lung cancer in 2001. Ringo Starr had chart-topping hits immediately following the breakup, such as It Don't Come Easy, Photograph, and You're 16. And at the point of this recording in 2020, Ringo Starr is still alive, as is Paul McCartney, who went on to work with the band Wings, recording Live and Let Die for the James Bond film of the same name. Paul McCartney ventured into the world of orchestral music, composing an entire ballet titled Ocean's Kingdom. Additionally, Sir Paul McCartney collaborated with Kanye West on Only One in 2014. The legacy of the Beatles lives on. Of course, there were competition and other invaders. The Beatles were not the only music makers of the 1960s, but they encompassed everything that the other British bands were doing. These other groups were not unsuccessful, they just never reached the same status as the Beatles. British groups like the Dave Clark Five, Herman's Hermits, the Animals, the Rolling Stones, the Hollies, the Zombies, the Who, the Kinks, vocalist Dusty Springfield, and even the American group The Monkees, all partook in this British invasion on American charts. American trumpet player, vocalist, and jazz ambassador Louis Armstrong resurfaced in 1964 and even managed to briefly knock the Beatles out of their number one slot on the charts. Louis Armstrong's Dixieland jazz rendition of Hello Dolly won two Grammy Awards in 1965 for Song of the Year and Best Vocal Performance. Uh... Hello, Dolly is from a Broadway musical of the same name. Please pause your video and give Hello, Dolly a quick listen. The Monkees were successful in the United States between 1966 and 1971. The group modeled themselves after the early Beatles, complete with the mop top haircuts. Ironically, the Monkees began as an escapist television series, not a performing band. It was after the series ended in 1968 that the group performed on stage. The Monkees are best known for Daydream Believer and I'm a Believer. Pause your video and please listen to Daydream Believer. Conversely, an actual British band, the Rolling Stones expanded upon the Beatles' rock and roll and exotic instrumentation flavor. Much like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones' early recording career includes covers of American rock and roll tunes like Chuck Berry's Come On. 
The height of the group's success was between 1965 and 1967. During those years, the Rolling Stones recorded I Can't Get No Satisfaction and Paint It Black. Paint It Black of 1966 is the first song featuring a sitar to go to number one on the charts. So please pause your video and listen to the Rolling Stones expanding upon the idea of incorporating Indian sitar into their music and give Paint It Black a listen. The Motown movement, gospel and pop fused in a Detroit-based recording studio, Motown Records. Between the years 1961 and 1971, that record label had 110 top 10 hits. Top artists on the Motown label included groups like the Supremes, the Four Tops, and even the Jackson 5. These artists all shared a common thread, the Funk Brothers. The Funk Brothers were the studio musicians at the record label. They were a tight-knit group of musicians that played on more number one hits than Elvis Presley, the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, and the Beatles combined. You can hear the Funk Brothers on Motown hits such as My Girl, I Heard It Through the Grapevine, Baby Love, Sign Sealed Delivered, I'm Yours, Papa Was a Rolling Stone, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Who's Loving You, What's Going On, and many, many more. Listen and see if you can hear any common threads behind the fronting artists on My Girl, Bernadette, and What's Going On. The Funk Brothers story was documented in the 2002 film Standing in the Shadows of Motown. So again, please pause your video and listen to the backing band on these three recordings. Other record studios hopped on the bandwagon in the 1960s but their studio bands never matched the success of the Funk Brothers. Based in Memphis, Stax Records had a house band, but the label's bigger claim to fame would be their fronting artists. Notable artists include Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, and Sam and Dave. Listen to the Stax Record house band on Wilson Pickett's In the Midnight Hour, and notice the playing compared to the Funk Brothers is a little more gritty. Stax Records was closely affiliated with Atlantic Records. The two companies shared many artists, including Ray Charles, Bobby Darin, Otis Redding, Sam and Dave, and Wilson Pickett. In 1966, Aretha Franklin signed with Atlantic Records and earned her Queen of Soul title, by pumping out hits such as R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Think, and You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, written by Carol King. But, please pause your video and listen to Respect. The Godfather of Soul, James Brown, recorded at King Records. Brown's vast catalog ranges from instrumental hits like Night Train to funkier tunes like Mother Popcorn. Brown's early hits like Out of Sight, Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, and I Got You, I Feel Good exhibit an unlikely emphasis shift. Since the jazz age, most African-American conceived music emphasizes what we call the backbeats, or beats two and four in a four-bar meter. These tunes emphasized beat one, and by 1967... James Brown music was deemed funky. Funk, as a genre, has origins in New Orleans R&B, coming from the late 1940s. Artists like Professor Longhair were incorporating complex Afro-Cuban rhythms into their own music, which became known as the Roomba Boogie. Listen to the Roomba Boogie, with Professor Longhair's Mardi Gras in New Orleans. The funk associated with James Brown expands upon the shift of rhythmic emphasis, adding syncopated bass lines, drum patterns, and guitar riffs. Listen to Brown's Cold Sweat, which is often cited as the first funk song. So again, pause your video and listen to The Funk. 
Rebels. Escapist television of the 1950s and 1960s, think of sitcoms like Bewitched and Gilligan's Island, they created the impression that all was well in the nation. But if one changed your television station over to the news, the United States was in complete and utter chaos. Assassinations and protests dominated the headlines. Therefore, artists and musicians decided to express their frustrations with blatant musical commentary. Bob Dylan is not well known for his guitar playing, harmonica playing, or singing. He is known for his poetic commentary on social issues. His catalog is filled with protest songs that became powerful anthems for the civil rights movement and anti-war movement. Additionally, his 1965 promotional video for Subterranean Homesick Blues is considered to be the first music video. Video synchronized with music is not new, but Bob Dylan's avant-garde approach paved the way for future music videos. So, please pause the video and listen to his two protest songs, Blowin' in the Wind and The Times They Are a-Changin' from 1963 and 1964, respectively. Akin to the music of Bob Dylan's earlier catalog, Simon and Garfunkel take on a folk rock flair. The duo imitates the sound of the previous decade's Everly Brothers, typically but not limited to singing in harmony with guitar accompaniment. There is controversy surrounding their The Sound of Silence, which was released shortly after the assassination of JFK. It was never made clear whether the song was intentional commentary. Give it a listen and see what you think. Other folk rock artists would hop on the protest song bandwagon as the 1960s escalated. Stephen Stills and Neil Young's group Buffalo Springfield had a top 10 hit with For What It's Worth. The tune is often associated with the anti-war movement, but was actually crafted for a protest of civil rights. Alice's Restaurant Massacre, which has since become a Thanksgiving Day anthem from 1967 by Arlo Guthrie, is an 18-minute satirical blues protesting the Vietnam War draft. Wooden Ships by Crosby, Stills, and Nash was released during the height of the Vietnam and Cold Wars and describes the consequences of nuclear war. Crosby, Stills, and Nash, this is the same Stephen Stills from Buffalo Springfield, who is joined by David Crosby from The Birds and Graham Nash from The Hollies. Later, Neil Young would join this group. For now, pause your video and listen to Buffalo Springfield's For What It's Worth. Similarly, Pete Seeger reemerged with Waist Deep in the Big Muddy, followed by a McCarthy era blacklisting thanks to the Smothers Brothers. The Smothers Brothers represent the highest tier of protest music. The duo had been present since 1961 with their album The Smothers Brothers at the Purple Onion. They combine a vaudevillian character styling, think Abbott and Costello with satiric rewriting of folk and popular song. Their success landed them a televised variety show called The Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, which aired from 1967 to 1969. Through use of daring political satire, the show became one of the most controversial shows aired during the Vietnam War era. Additionally, the show featured musical guests such as The Who and Harry Belafonte, The Who brought explosives to their performance that failed to fire during uh, rehearsal. The number of explosives was increased between rehearsal and performance, where they successfully went off and even injured the drummer. Harry Belafonte's presence on the show, uh, he had a musical number that never aired. This number was a calypso tune called Don't Stop the Carnival, and it was in front of a green screen. The footage that appeared behind Harry Belafonte were riots from the Democratic National Convention. 
we'll save musical examples from the Smothers Brothers for a later point in time. If we move over to country music, the first time that country music became a prominent force on the charts was with Johnny Cash. Despite his romanticized outlaw image in music, the man in black explained that he dressed in all black to respond to the Vietnam War, mourning the lives of those that could have been. Cash had been recording since the 1950s, but from his entire catalog, A Boy Named Sue of 1969 charted the highest, number two, on the Billboard Hot 100. Pause your video now and listen to A Boy Named Sue, the live recording that's uncensored. Perhaps too controversial for their time, The Velvet Underground did not receive commercial success during the 1960s. Lou Reed is most associated with this group, serving as the lead guitarist, vocalist, and songwriter. This American avant-garde rock band is retrospectively seen as one of the most influential rock bands of the 1960s, paving the way for punk and alternative rock. The group rebelled against social norms, blatantly introducing sexual kinkiness into lyric content. Andy Warhol the leading figure in the pop art visual art movement, was the Velvet Underground's manager. Warhol's personal favorite song was All Tomorrow's Parties, from the group's 1967 debut album, The Velvet Underground and Nico. Nico was the stage name for German female vocalist Christa Pafkin. Listen to some prepared piano and Schoenbergian cluster chords during all of tomorrow's parties. Make love, not war. The year 1968 pinpoints the modern divisions of American culture. Under Democratic President Johnson, the Vietnam War was in full swing. The Democrats expected Johnson to be renominated for the upcoming election, but other contenders emerged. John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert F. Kennedy, entered the scene with appealing progressive policies, as did Senator Eugene McCarthy, not to be confused with Joseph McCarthy of McCarthyism. President Johnson withdrew from the race, and his vice president, Hubert Humphrey became the establishment candidate, meaning the party backed him, not the people. Robert Kennedy was assassinated just after winning the California primaries. Kennedy's death extinguished any hope for McCarthy, and Humphrey became the Democratic candidate. The Democratic National Convention was the scene of a massive riot. Disappointed anti-war and civil rights folk protested in the streets and were subject to intense police brutality. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. only added gasoline to the divisive fire. While the Democrats were divided, Democrat George Wallace ran as an independent on an extremely racist platform and... Richard Nixon lurked in the corner. Nixon, defeated by John F. Kennedy, resurfaced at the right time. He appealed to the quote-unquote silent majority as a pillar of stability in these chaotic times. The race between Humphrey and Nixon was incredibly close, but thanks to the Electoral College, Nixon won by a landslide. Speaking of electoral colleges, Nixon lost the Republican primary popular vote to Ronald Reagan and still became the party's candidate. Oh, that antiquated electoral college. As 1969 rolled around, Nixon was inaugurated and the hippie movement retaliated with sex, drugs, and rock and roll at a music festival. During the planning process, the two-day-long music festival estimated 25,000 guests in the city of Wallkill, New York. However, 
city politics passed some last-minute laws prohibiting this event. Forced to relocate the festival to a dairy farm, the organizers of Woodstock were again caught in a bind. There was not enough time to build fencing. Audience arrived by the tens of thousands, peaking at 400,000, with no way to regulate ticket purchases. The festival unwillingly became a free event. The area's infrastructure was not equipped to handle the number of guests. People parked on the interstate. There were no, well, not enough bathrooms, and there was nowhere to really sleep. Despite all these hang-ups, though, there were really no fights. There was plenty of sex. There were lots of psychedelic drugs and lots of music. Woodstock featured 32 acts over the course of four days. Notable performers included Arlo Guthrie, Santana, The Grateful Dead, Credence Clearwater Revival, Janis Joplin, Sly and the Family Stone, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, Joe Cocker, The Band, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix's performance featured a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner that has been described as a statement against the Vietnam War. Hendrix uses extended techniques on his electric guitar to create warlike sound effects and quotes the bugle call taps. Please pause your video and give Hendrix's rendition of the national anthem a listen. While many of the performers at Woodstock were observed in the protest music section of this lecture, it is worth additional mention that Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin are both members of the 27 Club. The club did not earn its title until Kurt Cobain died in 1994 at age 27. Blues legend Robert Johnson was the first well-known musician to pass away at age 27 in 1938. Between 1969 and 1971, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison from The Doors, and Brian Jones from The Ro Rolling Stones also coincidentally died at the age of 27. But now on to the Piano Men. Sing us a song. The electric guitar craze of the early 1960s gained competition by the late 1960s with the rock piano craze. By the late 1960s, organ and electric piano players that also sang fronted rock and pop timbres. The Doors are an early example of rock bands prominently featuring organ. The studio recordings of the group feature a quintet, vocals, organ, guitar, bass, and drums. During live performance, however, the instrumentation was reduced to a quartet, vocals, guitar, organ, and drums no bass. Ray Manzarek, the group's organ and keyboard player, would play the bass lines in addition to his own keyboard parts. Pianist and vocalist Elton John's debut album, Elton John, was a hit both in his native United Kingdom as well as in the United States. Your Song went to number eight on the American charts and began a streak of number one albums for Elton John. Other chart-topping hits from John's early catalog include Tiny Dancer, Rocket Man, Crocodile Rock, Daniel, Benny and the Jets, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Candle in the Wind, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, and Funeral for a Friend slash Love Lies Bleeding. Please pause the video and listen to your song. Though popular songs like She's Got Away and Everybody Loves You Now appeared on Billy Joel's first studio album, Cold Spring Harbor, the album was a technical and commercial flop. Billy Joel's slow ascent to popularity began with his next album, Piano Man of 1973. The album's title track has become his signature song. He continued to land on the charts over the next several years with songs like The Entertainer, New York State of Mind, and Say Goodbye to Hollywood. Billy Joel displays his virtuosity on the instrument on Prelude slash Angry Young Man. 
It is not until 1977's album, The Stranger, that Billy Joel made it closer to the tops of the charts with songs like Just the Way You Are, Moving Out, She's Always a Woman, Only the Good Die Young. Billy Joel's career did not peak until the 1980s with songs like Tell Her About It, The Longest Time, and We Didn't Start the Fire. Please pause your video and listen to Billy Joel tear up a piano on the prelude to The Angry Young Man. The 1960s songsmith Carole King emerged as a pianist and vocalist in the early 1970s. Her 1971 album Tapestry featured her renditions of compositions of her own compositions like Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow and You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman. The album held the number one album slot for 15 consecutive weeks, while the It's Too Late from that album went to number one on the Billboard singles. Both Tapestry and It's Too Late won Grammy Awards in 1972. Carol King's story can be seen in a Broadway show called Beautiful. It's electric. As the trend continued to pick up steam, some pianists began to favor synthesizers over acoustic or even electric pianos. The year 1968 welcomed synthesizers to mainstream and real music with Wendy Carlos's Switched on Bach, an album of Johann Sebastian Bach works performed on a Moog synthesizer. Listen to a little Switched on Bach. Stevie Wonder had been an active member in the Motown circuit since he was 11 years old, but in 1970, when Stevie Wonder was 20, he heard Tonto's expanding headband. The electronic band's influences led him to produce the 1972 album Talking Book, which features a clavinet on superstition. The album also featured You Are the Sunshine of My Life. The two songs won three collective Grammy Awards. Stevie Wonder continued to pump chart-topping hits throughout the 1970s with songs like Higher Ground, I Wish, Sir Duke, and Isn't She Lovely. Stevie Wonder's career peaked in the 1980s following film and television appearances, collaborations with the biggest names in the business, and the most record sales of his career. But please pause your video and listen to that clavinet on Superstition. One of the many fifth Beatles, Billy Preston would also hop on the synthesizer train. Following his 1973 chart-topping songs, Will It Go Round in Circles and Nothing From Nothing, Billy Preston's synthesizer-driven instrumental tune, Space Race, went to number four on the charts. Please pause your video and give Billy Preston a listen. The Isley Brothers, of shout fame, even wound up on the synthesizer bandwagon. They had a few Motown hits like Testify, which featured Jimi Hendrix on lead guitar, and that was in 1964, as well as This Old Heart of Mine in 1966. The group had a number two hit with It's Your Thing of... 1969. In 1972, they released the album Brother, 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 which featured top 40 hits such as Love the One You're With. The 1973 album 3 Plus 3 included synthesizer heavy tunes like That Lady. Please pause your video and listen to That Lady. Other groups would also contribute to the post- Beatles' Is That a Rock and Roll Instrument category. Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album features a cash register along with many other synthesized effects on money. As the rock movement further evolved, groups like Chicago, Led Zeppelin, and Black Sabbath would uniquely alter sounds creating innovative timbres. Burn, baby, burn. Like Woodstock, the disco movement is celebrated for joining together peoples of many different cultures. The dance-driven music frequently utilizes synthesizers, syncopated bass lines, and four-on-the-floor grooves. Unlike Woodstock, disco-flavored disc jockeys or DJs over live bands. 
the performance end of the music industry began to sweat. The music of this movement does not present much innovation. Most of the sounds heard here were present during the Motown movement. Artists gaining popularity during this dance-centric movement included groups like the Bee Gees, the Jackson 5, Gloria Gaynor, Barry White, KC and the Sunshine Band, the Electric Light Orchestra, Donna Summer, the Tramps, the Village People, ABBA, Cool and the Gang, and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Groups not associated with disco also recorded tunes with danceable disco flair, such as Queen's Another One Bites the Dust. Many of these previously mentioned artists did not survive on the scene after the disco movement fizzled out in the late 1970s. Please pause your video and give a listen to the Tramp's Disco Inferno as well as the Village People's YMCA. Disco served as a wonderful distraction from politics and current events. During his second term, President Nixon was at the center of not one, but two political scandals. The first was the Pentagon Papers, the second was Watergate. Following Watergate, President Nixon resigned. The roof is on fire. The idea of the DJ putting performing musicians out of business would have been what John Philip Sousa had nightmares about. Remember him from the early American music lecture and his treatise? The ability for someone to play music with the ease of flipping a switch or placing a needle on a record ensued that live musicians were no longer necessary. The final innovation for the music scene births hip-hop and rap. DJs that spoke in rhythm, synchronized with the beat of the songs that they had queued up, birthed this genre. Grandmaster Flowers is credited as being the first DJ to speak with the beat. The pioneer of the hip-hop genre mixed records together in sequence in the late 1960s. He influenced DJ's Grandmaster Flash and Africa Bambata of the early 1970s. DJ Cool Herc also had profound influence on Grandmaster Flash and Africa Bambata. Using a double turntable setup, he would fill the space between record transitions with rhythmically spoken accompaniment that would later be identified as rap. Speaking with the beat is not a foreign idea. Louis Armstrong often spoke during the musical portions of his recordings. Most Broadway musical dialogue is synchronized with a musical underscore. DJs executing this function are the innovation combined with improvisatory record scratching. While rap often contains violent language and insults, understanding the roots of this dialogue is key. Human beings have been displaying acts of violence since the beginning of time. Remember, every war, ever? Coincidentally, humans have also been insulting one another since the earliest records of civilization. Yo Mama styled jokes and various exchanges of these insults date back to ancient Egypt. Rap also includes progressive messages more than violent messages. The Roof is on Fire by Rockmaster Scott and the Dynamic Three includes a short version of Malcolm X's Field Slave vs. House Slave speech. In Malcolm X's speech, a hypothetical slave master's home catches on fire and a house slave helps protect the home, trying to extinguish the fire. The Field Slave contrastingly roots for the house to burn. Listen for the very explicit chorus on The Roof is on Fire Now. The Death of Music The final nail in the coffin for music was the advent of MTV, or music television. The experimental television channel launched on August 1st of 1981. The channel's design was not expected to be successful. Exclusively broadcasting music videos was the design of this channel, nothing else. 
Following the introduction from the VJs, or video jockeys, the first music video to be aired on MTV was the appropriately titled Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles. Go ahead and pause your video and listen to Video Killed the Radio Star. Better yet, you can go on YouTube and look up the original music video for Video Killed the Radio Star. Video would, in fact, kill the radio star, as music videos end up destroying music as a sonic art form. The new medium now required a visual aspect combined with a sonic component. Music videos were not plentiful in the early days of MTV. Artists with the most music videos, like Rod Stewart, owe a great deal of their popularity to their monopolized screen time. These early music videos were not polished quality products either. Strange, very strange videos of horses walking through the fog, parodies of the Phantom of the Opera, nightmarish animations, and rock stars with mullets dominated the screen. Through the mid-1980s into the 1990s, the art form of music video production really blossomed. While artists such as Michael Jackson, Madonna, Cyndi Lauper, Boy George, Janet Jackson, Prince, David Bowie, Journey, Nirvana, Boys to Men, Salt and Pepper, Dr. Dre, and Snoop Doggy Dogg all had presence off screen, they certainly gained popularity thanks to music videos. By the mid-1990s, the novelty of music videos wore off, and the programming shifted to the dreaded reality television. Thank you for tuning in to this lecture. We'll look for you in the next one.